question. John, my first question is for you. As I look through this Constitution, Article 1, Section 2, third paragraph, it states in, in 1789 that a black person was three-fifths of a citizen. That certainly reflects, what shall I say, a degree of racism at best. Why should we follow such a document that has such words in its first article? Judge, I'm surprised. You misread the Constitution. It doesn't say a black person is three-fifths of a citizen. It says persons held to service or labor shall be counted for purposes of enumeration or representation as three-fifths of a person. And the point of that was to deny the slave owners added representation in Congress so that they could put the slavery in the course of ultimate extinction. They understood they had to have a compromise with slavery to get a constitution at all, but they also went out of their way not to mention the word slavery and to codify the principle of Republican guarantee of government. And this, this comes to the forefront in a wonderful debate in 1818 to 1820 over the admission of Missouri as a state. And they, they're looking at this, these three-fifths clause and the fugitive slave clause uh, and, and saying that this protection of slavery that is in the constitution uh, is a compromise with our principle. The guarantee of a Republican form of government is the principle itself. Uh, and when we don't have to be limited to living with the compromise, as we had to in the original states, um, then we should follow the principle. And it required that they look beyond the Constitution to the principles as codified in the Declaration of Independence. So that three-fifths clause was designed to eliminate slavery at the earliest possibility. The third clause is the, the uh, authority to Congress to prohibit the slave trade as early as 1808, which they promptly did. Uh, so the principles are there for anyone that will look at them. Can you apply some of those principles to Brown versus Board of Education, following up on what Dean Shemrinsky said? I can, and you know, Brown is correctly decided as a matter of original principle. Uh, and they didn't have to make that up uh, in Brown, and they didn't have to adopt Justice Marshall's throwaway last half of his opinion in his brief uh, when, when he argued the case about you know, evolving social science. The first part of his brief in that case is a principled defense of equality in the Declaration of Independence. And, it, and, 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 the, and the precedent he wished he could cite was not a majority opinion, but was instead a dissent that looked at the principles of the 14th Amendment uh, and, 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 and did what John Marshall Harlan did in Plessy versus Ferguson in dissent. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes amongst its citizens. Now that was true in 1898 when he wrote it, or 1896. It was true in 1868 when it was adopted. It was true in 1776 when the Declaration was written. Uh, and it was true in 1954 when Brown did it. And I wish the Brown decision had been grounded on that principle rather than a much more nebulous uh, social science research that it grounded it on. All right. Yes, please. Absolutely. <laughs> it's very important to note the move just John just made. Throughout the debate, he's wanted to say, follow the text of the Constitution. But when the issue of Brown comes up, what does he appeal to? The Declaration of Independence. That's not the text of the Constitution. The Declaration of Independence actually has no legally authoritative status. Take the issue of segregation. That's, of course, the underlying question in Brown versus Board of Education. The 14th Amendment in its text doesn't speak to that. It says, nor shall any state deny any person its jurisdiction equal protection of laws. Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 said, it's consistent with the text to have required segregation so long as there's equal, separate but equal. I think that's consistent with the text. Now, what about the original understanding, the underlying principle? As I pointed out, the same Congress that ratified the 14th Amendment voted to segregate the District of Columbia public schools. It is impossible to reconcile Brown versus Board of Education with the notion of a static constitution. You can only get to Brown if you say that the court can follow more abstract and general principles. But once you say that, no longer is there the constraint that anything can be justified in what the court does, then John and I are defending the exact same position. Judge Guilford's question is so important because our constitution was written in 1787 for an agrarian slave society. It was written when it was amended in the 14th Amendment 1868 by a deeply unequal society that still tolerated so much race discrimination. Congress could vote to segregate the District of Columbia Public Schools. We can't be governed by the literal fixed intent of those generations. It has to be an evolving back. 